Welcome back to the second half of episode 7, the Shane Talks podcast, the James Bond episode. This week we're going to wrap up our James Bond discussion by talking about uh, Timothy Dalton, Pierce Brosnan, and Daniel Craig, their runs as James Bond, as well as a little bit of James Bond Jr., some GoldenEye video game talk, and we go off on a couple of random tangents near the end of this. But enjoy the second half. We've got about another hour and 20 minutes to go. Thanks for listening. So, real quick, full disclosure, uh, 1987 Timothy Dalton, this is... This is where my real James Bond experience began, because Timothy Dalton was my mom's James Bond. Uh, so starting uh, with The Living Daylights in 87, like, this is his two movies. He only did two, but, like, he's who my mom loved as James Bond. So, like, those two Timothy Dalton ones were the ones that were always on in my house. Uh, how Jason had mentioned all the VHS stuff that they did uh, with, uh, with Roger Moore, like, my mom watched these two James Bond movies all the time. So maybe uh, she, maybe she wanted to be one of the Bond girls. Uh, maybe she did. Uh, so in '87 we had the Living Daylights, um, which uh, Brandon, uh, I don't remember uh, which of the two Timothy Dalton movies starts with. This, this this going back and watching them. This is the thing that pisses me off about one of these two movies is the opening sequence is when he, like, him and, and one of the other double O's parachute in, and it's, like, all white, and they have, like, what ends up being a paintball fight, where you think it's actually a real fight at the beginning, and then it's a training exercise. That's that's this one. That's this one. That pissed me off every time I watched it, because yeah. I was like, oh, Bond's going in and doing all this cool stuff, but it's not real. But it's not a training exercise. I thought it was. Yeah, so did Bond. Oh. And then there was somebody there that was actually killing those double O's, and he's the only one that gets out alive. And then oh. he parachutes down to that yacht, like you were talking that, about. Okay. And so introduces that's, himself. This is all coming back together now. Yeah. Seven-year-old um, Shane is remembering things. <laughs> so they actually pulled that from the start of Never Say Never Again, um, oh, okay. when Sean Connery came back. That was... I think it was the opening to that movie was yeah it was during the theme song was him trying to prove that he could still be a double o and he wasn't too old okay it was, so it was this whole big training thing um so when they introduced timothy dalton as the new bond they did that same thing where he's training for a lot of it he has this mask on um so they call him 007 so you you know which one it is and then mm -hmm. he lifts the mask and you're like oh this is this new actor um but yeah there's uh there's somebody who's killing the double o's during this oh, and, okay uh, there's some russian phrase that translates to death to spies i don't remember what the actual phrase is that they put on all the double o's as they kill them and he uh he kind of chases them down and that's kind of the big opening credits sequence gotcha um i actually really like this movie uh, uh, so let's see. Whole. The, the the opening is the KGB defector at the uh, the music the music venue thing or whatever. Uh, there's the chick sniper I remember, and then I remember him taking the guy to like some underground tube tunnel thing, where uh, where he like shoots him to Austria or something. They were smuggling him out of um, the like communist occupied territories and they shot him through this uh i think it was a tube that was supposed to be used for oil yeah oh, okay. um to a country that was friendly with england so they could extradite him nice uh let's see yeah uh... oh yeah dude jonathan reese davies yes the new yep. head of the kgb Yep. Uh, the the bad guy is trying to have him assassinated through the movie, so there's a lot of there's a lot of good Timothy Dalton, Jonathan Reese Davies scenes. Yep. Uh, our Bond girl is Kara Malovi, which is lame. One of my favorites. I mean, I'm sure she's good, but her name is lame. They could have done something the, better. The name is lame, but what I really like about her is she's one of the few. I want to say artistic Bond girls. Okay. Because, I mean, she plays the cello. She's dating this guy who she doesn't know is a spy 
for the KGB. Uh So she's just kind of caught in the middle of it. She just wants to kind of play her cello and be fun. And um, is this the is this the actress that was on uh, Law and Order for a long time? I don't think so. I think her sister is more famous than she is, but I can't think of their names right now. Yeah, I don't have it written down. It looks like Jason's looking it up. So give me just a second. Kara sure. Malovi is the yep. uh, the girl in the Living Daylights that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I actually really oh, like Oh, Diabo. Or... Yeah, Miriam Diabo. Yes. Okay. And her sister was... Uh... More famous than her. I can't... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, it's the chick who was in, um, oh my gosh, Diablo. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, you know her. Fred Savage. Olivia. Yeah. Olivia Diablo. Yes. Wasn't she the sister in, um, Fred Savage, Wonder Years? Oh, really? Am I thinking correctly? That might That's be something. where I know that name for, like the name. It is Olivia familiar. Diablo. You're yeah, right. that Karen is- Arnold. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, she's she. Whoa. Olivia Diablo. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm partial to Miriam Diablo, but either way. <laughs> oh, the Diablo sisters. <laughs> uh, so then the second, uh, Timothy Dalton, who R- is always. Quick. Yeah, good. Real quick about uh, about this one. Yeah. Um, so a, a couple of things. First of all, Pierce Brosnan was actually first in line at this point to take over. But he was doing but, uh, um, a Scarecrow Mrs. King. Yeah. Remington, Remington they, Steel. Or, yeah, so there, yeah, Remington Steel. And they wouldn't let him out of his contract for it. NBC actually had canceled Remington Steel. Okay. Pierce Brosnan agreed to be Bond. And then NBC found this out and they were like, hey, we want the Bond actor to be on our network. And so oh. they ordered more networks or more episodes of Remington Steel. And then uh, Cubby Broccoli, the producer, was like, well, he can't do both. He won't have time. Sure. He'll be casting uh, uh, Timothy Dalton instead. Um, so License to Kill, uh, yeah. Am Bouvier is mm-hmm. the actress I was thinking about. It's uh, Carrie Lowell. Uh, Lowell? Yeah. Lowell? Yeah. Lowell. Uh, she, um, she was on Law & Order for a long time. She, gotcha. one of the, she was one of the uh, district attorney like assistants or whatever. Well, <laughs> and I mean, this this movie is just top to bottom an amazing cast. Ooh, you've got, you've got, you've got Robert John there. Davey from The Goonies as your villain, who that dude is just amazing as, as a villain. Uh, you got Benicio del Toro as a henchman. Wayne Newton is in it. Priscilla Barnes, who I love from Mallrats. Dude, don't laugh. Wayne Newton is low key the best part of this movie. <laughs> Dude, my favorite though is Shane is like, no, he's a part of this great cast. <laughs> no, he plays like this uh, this like televangelist yes. who is laundering money. Like, yep. he's I so great. Well, and then and then finally, Sang Soon That's himself, Kerry Hiro Yuki Takagawa, is in this movie also. I have no I don't idea who that is. Oh, you guys haven't seen Mortal Kombat, Sang Soon? Oh, oh yeah, oh, no, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're yeah. token Asian guy in the late nineties. Yeah, yeah. Yep. He has a he has a part in this movie also. But yeah, uh, Robert John Davy as uh, as Franz Sanchez is just is a fun villain. I like yeah. him. Um, really, uh, Benicio del Toro kind of steals every scene that he's sure. in. He's he's great. I think it was one of his first roles too. But yeah, he's he's really good in this one. It's and, I mean, uh, it's super late eighties drug running movie. Like you. it's kind of paint by numbers. There's a really cool scene towards the end with a with a semi truck that they they put on like just three wheels. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Built it to the side. He's got to dodge the. the he's got to dodge the missile. Well, yeah, and, yeah. And, and to be the honest, RPG. I'm not 100 percent sure because I, 
this is one that I grew up with, but Bond wasn't an MI agent in this movie. He actually wasn't technically 007. No. So um, uh, at the beginning, uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, what's her name from Three's Company? Uh, Priscilla Barnes. Priscilla Barnes. Yep. Um, so she marries Felix. Um, and then on their wedding night, Felix is kidnapped because he is running this big drug bust against um, Sanchez. Mm-hmm. And uh, Benicio del Toro essentially feeds him to the sharks. He loses a leg and a couple of other parts. And uh, <laughs> um, so it's it's very much a revenge flick for yeah. Bond. He, um, they're at the, uh, um, oh, it's a famous writer's house with all the cats. Um, I can't remember. Um, but they're at a, a famous author's house when they, when Bond like basically turns in his badge and gun and, um, kind of goes freelance to try to avenge, um, Felix's death. Um, and uh, so a lot of a lot of what I remember reading this week was these two films that uh, that Timothy Dalton did were were an attempt to go back to Sean Connery vibes. Like they felt like uh, Roger Moore was a little too comedy, like didn't didn't do the spy thing justice. So these two movies, I remember them trying to be very much more spy action, womanizing again, kind of. I wouldn't go as far as saying womanizing, okay. but definitely spy action movies. They were more grounded in reality. Mm-hmm. You know, you didn't have ridiculous uh, gadgets from Q or anything like that. Um, uh, anybody that likes Daniel Craig movies should go back and watch these because nice. they were, I would call it, consider them ahead of their time in that they were more serious and kind of didn't find their audience because of that. Outside of the fact that I think in uh, The Living Daylights, he sides with Al-Qaeda, oh. which didn't age well. No, that was but not. At the, but at the time was on America's side. <laughs> Al-Qaeda and America were best of friends in the late 80s. Yeah. But hey, Shane's mom loved him anyway, so it's okay. <laughs> well, and then, I mean, uh, if we want to go uh, 1991, two years later, Timothy Dalton played Neville Sinclair uh, the in the great film The Rocketeer. Um, true just watched it this week which has nothing to do with james bond but i wanted to bring up the rocketeer because i love that movie uh honestly i would say outside of sean connery who act who had an excellent career considering he started off as mr universe and then transitioned to bond and then had some really good moments um as an actor um i think daniel i keep saying daniel uh timothy dalton had the best Post Bond career. I could definitely uh, see that. I think he's made some really good decisions and been in some really good movies. For sure. Uh, so now we hit 1995. Now we real, hit. Real quick. Oh, yeah. Um, the reason there was such a long oh, delay. Yeah, here, six, six years is a long time for Bond. It's, it's, it's the longest of any gap between okay. Bond movies. It's due to a couple of reasons, mostly MGM. Um, financial problems. Okay. Which is a running theme with Bond movies. <laughs> um, but uh, there was also a legal battle, again, with uh, McClure. They were trying to get the rights back from him for oh, Spectre wow. and all of that. Um, so they could remake Thunderball for the third time? <laughs> God. God help us. <laughs> um, but uh, you, if you look around online, you can find treatments for what they call Bond 17. Okay. Or sometimes property of a lady is what it was titled. Okay. Um, and in these, Bond teamed up with um, a retiring spy and jewel smuggler to try to take down a Hong Kong-based to- uh, terrorist oh. who was trying again trying to start World War Three. Ah. Um, and parts of these were used in Tormund Never Dies. Um, especially like the Hong Kong stuff. Sure. Um, it was big at the moment because, you know, the Cold War was over, so they were trying to find new a new villains. story that you yep. could use. Yeah. Um, 
and Hong Kong was switching over from, I believe, British rule to Chinese, Chinese rule yep. in the late 90s. Um, so they're trying to stay kind of topical with that. Gotcha. Um, and I don't the 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 treatments that I've read for for Bond Seventeen were uh, really interesting. And I wish Timothy Dalton would have had a chance to make another movie because he uh, was actually pretty solid and didn't get the credit. Uh, so was it his choice not to come back for Goldeneye, or did MGM decide it was time to finally get Pierce Brosnan? It had been six years. He had kind of given up hope and moved on to other things. Okay. Um, and it was no more foreplay. Of, what's that? <laughs> no more foreplay. <laughs> right. right. No. Uh, I mean, Pierce Brosnan had wanted to do it. Um, he actually dated one of the Bond girls in a Roger Moore movie. Oh. So okay. he had been in the in the running for Bond for like. 15 years at this point wow and so it was kind of a mix of the fact that he was finally free and timothy dalton was kind of over it that they moved on uh in 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 my notes for this i have in all capital letters the best bond film ever made period (laughs) um this is my this is my james bond uh to to the effect that timothy dalton was my mom's james bond this is the first Bond film I ever saw in the theater. Uh, I saw it uh, downtown Indianapolis at the United Artists Circle Center uh, Theater opening weekend. Um, it blew my mind. I'd obviously grown up with those 80s James Bonds, those the, the two Timothy Dalton ones. This movie blew my mind. Yeah. Um, 006, I mean, so, uh, Trouglin, b- Before yes. you get into the plot, yeah. just real quick, I think all three of us, this is probably the first one we saw in the theater. Yep. Um, I mean, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's of the time, but very much for our generation, oh, this yeah. is our bond. This is um, bond. So I have kind of a unique story here. I got into bond because of James Bond Jr. I don't know if oh, either. Of you I've definitely seen that. that cartoon. Yep. Um, so like, when that was that one of the air? Was that early nineties or mid nineties? That was mid nineties. Mid nineties? Mid nineties. Okay. Uh, I, I want to say eighties, early nineties, but. Oh, yeah, you might be right. It might have been early 90s because that would have made sense for me to be um, right for Shane and I to be in like middle school or yeah. like fifth grade, maybe middle school ish. Yeah. So that. I was I was thinking like maybe 91, 92 I when I would that. have been six or seven. Um, and I, I loved the show. I thought it was a lot of fun. Sure. And I remember um, being at my cousin's birthday party, and he was like he was in his teens, probably, probably a little older than you guys. And uh, he got the whole James Bond series on VHS nice. for his birthday. And I was like, oh, I watched James Bond Jr. This is great. You should put one of these on. But I was like six. And so everybody <laughs> else at the party was like, no, 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 you don't need to be watching these movies. And so it became like this forbidden fruit for me, right? Ah. But in the early, so in the early 90s, uh, uh, Turner Broadcasting got the rights to air them. They were on dinner and a movie all the time. I don't know if you guys remember that show. Yep. Uh-huh. Um, and my mom had a rule where if it was on TV, then it was edited down enough that you could watch it. Sure. And they did all these Bond movies on dinner and a movie. So I was like, Perfect. I recorded them on my v, v, uh, VCR, and um, that's kind of how I got into Bond, because um, it was like this forbidden thing that I was suddenly allowed to watch. So I remember when Goldeneye came out, I was, um, I was 10 when it came out, but I was so excited for this movie um, that I was like, I remember talking to my, my, I was in fifth grade at the time, and I remember talking to my teacher and being like, uh, he, he was a big Bond fan and be like, oh, I'm so excited for this movie. And he's like, really? You're 10. You shouldn't be excited for a James <laughs> Bond movie. Uh, and then talking to him about like what he thought about it. It came out, I think, uh, Thanksgiving break. Yeah. November. Yep. It was and, uh, November. And I, November I remember 25th. asking him. Yeah. I remember asking him after Thanksgiving break if he liked it. And he was like, 
eh, it was okay. It wasn't as fun as the others. And I was like, no, it was awesome. It was the best movie ever. <laughs> that opening sequence with the dam where it opens on the feet running yes! and then him jumping up on the dam and then shooting the gun and then he propels down. And then it's like all so of a sudden good. you're in a bathroom and you're like, why am I in a bathroom? And then all of a sudden he comes out of the ceiling of the bathroom and you're like, oh my God, this movie is so good. Oh. I, I, I love, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know why Martin Campbell can only make good Bond movies. Because <laughs> his other movies are kind of shit. But his Bond movies are great. I was like, oh, I, I want to say that like I've liked some of his other movies, but now I'm like, I can't remember all the ones that he made. Then he, uh, did, like, he did Layer Cake, right? No, 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 no. that was uh, Matthew Vaughn. Yeah. Oh, Matthew Vaughn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. He did. Yeah, yeah. He did um, uh, Green Lantern. Well, see, he did but, November no, Man. No, no, but like, come on, man. Like, uh, going back to like that time frame, like, pulling it up real quick. Like, did he do uh, Daylight? Goldeneye, he hits the ball. He home run, no yes. question. Mask of Zorro, I love that movie. Yeah, the first Mask of Zorro, so good. Then he does it vertical limit, eh. and then he followed it up with Beyond Borders. I never saw it. Uh, Angelina Jolie movie, uh, uh, Legend of Zorro, which was shit yeah. compared to that first movie. Uh, but then he follows that up by Casino Royale, and I mean, like, and looking at the rest of his stuff, it's. Um, since then, it's Edge of Darkness with the Mel Gibson, Green Lantern, um, mm. and then The Foreigner with uh, Jackie Chan. But oh, actually, yeah. it was it was okay. The Foreigner um, was good, but could have been better. Absolutely, it was, but it yeah, was okay. definitely his two uh, his two Bond films and For Mask sure. of Zorro are definitely the best yeah. films of yeah. his career. His his two Bond films are top five. Oh yeah, I'd love, I'd love to see him come back and do another one. Yeah, he his and uh, we can get. I mean, we'll get to Casino Royale, but yeah, yeah Goldeneye was definitely like, let yeah. alone what the implications for us at the time when Nintendo sixty four came out with Goldeneye yep. and like literally the best yeah. first person shooter of all time of all um, time. Really, and, 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 and it and it really like if you try to go back and play it now. Like, I enjoy it, but it's nowhere near the level of it was. And I think a lot of that has to do with, like, graphic-wise, it, it, it hurts the eyes, and I'm not used to it anymore. Um, controllers, you've got on, one stick that's, like, doing everything. You know, yeah, it, it's it's a little strange. Um, but, I but like, at that time, that was, like, the definitive video game. 100%. Like, that That is what paved the way for all first-person shooters now. It, it laid the groundwork for Halo which laid the groundwork for other things like Destiny. It laid the groundwork for Call of Duty. Like, I mean, it literally, it, any any PvP first-person shooter game out there owes everything to GoldenEye and what it created. Like, that, Well, and the, the video game was cool. The, 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 Single the player. PvP was cool. Yeah. And that was something revolutionary at that time. But yep. like even the game itself was a lot of was fun. Was a lot of play. fun. I am so, so honestly so excited wanted... for the remake that they're doing with the with the Unreal Engine. Like if you, if oh, you, I didn't see that. If you jump on YouTube, you can type in GoldenEye uh, Unreal, and there's like a 12 minute uh, video of the demo of the first level, and it looks absolutely fantastic. Uh, I think it's coming out next year or 2022, but like. This guy has literally gone through and redone the entire game with the current Unreal Engine, and it, 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 I highly suggest going to YouTube and watching the first mission because it looks beautiful. That's awesome. Because yeah. yeah. the the update that they did on the like Wii era systems was not yep. good. was not no. Good. No, I agree. I, I got excited uh, for it and thought yeah. that it was going to be worth playing again, and it literally looked the exact same as my N64 when it's hooked up. Yeah. Well, and the controls were super bad too. I don't know if you had a Wii or if you were playing on it on a different system, but it was impossible to like steer sure. and aim yep. and shoot, and it was nuts. I I, I agree. It was. It but was uh, yeah, that original game was ridiculous, and it's it's honestly part of the reason where a big part of the reason why people our age remember the movie so much. Oh sure. It was oh, yeah. such a good adaptation. Um, you know, there were some extraneous levels that they added just to kind of fill out the game. But I mean, that that faculty level or faculty, the facility level yeah. where, you know, um, he's kind of going through. Um, I mean, that, 
that matches up the movie pretty closely. Sure. And, um, the, this, the sequence on the train was pretty good. And um, yeah. yeah, it was, it was one of the few video games of the time that actually adapted the, the source movie material. perfectly. Yeah, I agree. What are you going to say, Jason? Yeah, I was going to say, going back to the movie, though, um, Femke Jensen. Zinnia on a top. Yeah, Zeta, at least we got a we got a quasi good one there with on a top, and he got to he yeah. got to have some good uh, some good one liners in the movie. Um, he killed yeah. people with her thighs. Of course, he had some good one liners. <laughs> uh, she tried to strangle him to death with her thighs twice. Yep, successfully. Yep. Uh, Alessandro no- Alessandro Novola <laughs> as Boris. Oh um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and of course, we had Boris and Natasha in the movie because why yeah. not? Um, I don't know what else she's been in besides that uh, Exorcist prequel, but she was pretty yeah. good in. She was, yeah, she was, she was. Good uh, in you had Alan Cummings was in it. Yep, he was Boris. Um, who was the uh, Sean Bean? I mean, like, yep. I mean, uh, every uh, oh, they yeah, died all the and actors then really died, so he kind of got yep. two in that movie. Yep. So yeah, like uh, solid movie, man. Like literally. It, it, I'd I, say I, I, I do and need to really probably the... correct myself that I said Alessandro Novola. I always screw that up. It's Alan Cumming. I get the two of them confused because I'm an idiot. No Alessandro Novola in this movie. You're, you're um, I think Casino Royale is made better than Goldeneye, but it's probably the nostalgia factor that makes me love Goldeneye even more than any other James Bond. If so, Goldeneye so. is on TV, I cannot turn it off. No. That that is a movie that if it's, I see it, I have to turn it on and I have to watch. It, I just it's so good. It's that perfect mix of Roger Moore over the top and Sean Connery like badass spy. Sure. That they only find in like three or four of these twenty five movies that they've made, <laughs> where the, um... it's you know it's not ridiculous and it's not too serious that it's just. Uh, Brandon, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong. The CIA, the white guy that's his CIA contact, he was in the early. Was it the Timothy Dalton movies that he was in? Okay, yes. that's what I. That's what I thought. So that this is another running theme of Bond movies. You see the same actors over and over um, playing the supporting roles. Yeah, so he had played a bad guy in, I believe, The Living Daylights. Okay, um, and then. The producers just liked him, liked working with him, so they brought him back for for this and the next one, I believe. Yeah, he was in two sure. in a row. Yeah, I think he was in. I thought I was going to say he was either in two or three different ones. Yeah, because he's in. I think he's in this and Tomorrow Never Dies, and then um, uh, what's his play? What's his name that plays uh, the his Russian connection? Oh, the guy who Here's, played Haggard. Um, yes, in the, Haggard. Race Davies. John. No, 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 not John. No, Harris, uh, the guy who played Haggard in the Harry yes. Potter movies. What's his um, name? Yeah, he also shows up in The World Is Not Enough. Um. Yeah. Uh, I was just there. It's another three-person name. Robbie Coltrane. Oh no, yeah, Robbie, Coltrane. Coltrane. no Coltrane. Coltrane. Robbie Coltrane. Yeah, yeah, there you go, Robbie yeah. Coltrane. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah. All right, so we've talked yeah, about Goldeneye you know, a lot in the video game because it's many drivers best. in it. She has a little cameo before she was anything. Well, uh, two years later, we got our next James Bond or our next our next Pierce Brosnan movie with the complete utter piece of crap called Tomorrow Never Dies, which had a great actor as the villain Jonathan Price, yep. uh, who tries to use the media to start World War Three. <laughs> And I literally don't think there's anything good about this movie. So if you don't want to talk about it, I'm fine moving on. Uh, Terry, Terry Hatcher. Hatcher. Solid. I Paris, don't mind. Paris Carver. Yep. Terrible I don't mind Bond the, name. The, uh, the car that he can drive with his cell phone in the back seat. Oh, that was cool. I thought uh, that was a good thing. Okay. Michelle Yeoh's in it. Uh, Michelle Yeoh. Michelle Yeoh yeah. was the highlight of this movie. She was very good. The Honestly, the the... The biggest problem with this movie is the faulty premise. Okay. So he's a he's a media mogul yep. in 1997 yep. who wants <laughs> exclusive broadcasting rights in Hong Kong and China. 
this was maybe a year before the internet came around and then <laughs> suddenly who gives a shit about broadcasting rights like mm -hmm. like his he 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 was trying to secure that for a hundred years and just his whole plan was so short-sighted he's trying to start world war three for broadcasting rights it's like uh, and like if I remember room. right, like Act Three or like the big face off at the end is like in his giant massive room with all the televisions in it. With yeah, like, and he's not even—they're not even fighting. Like they're just talking. Yeah, I think that was that was in the second act. Still was it? Oh, okay, all right. Because they escape by uh, ripping his banner. They like they tie themselves to the banner and they jump. And they're able to go down like his high rise. That's right. But they only get like yeah. two thirds of the way down. The third act takes place on his um, his like his stealth boat. That's what it is. That's wow. right. Because he was going to be boat. able to hide from everybody. Yep. Yes, so he, cool. he was able to shoot like American missiles at the Chinese boats or something and try to start oh. number three from oh. the stuff. I don't know. It's all right. Let's move on. Uh, so 1999, <laughs> if you've listened to the first episode of Shane Talks, 1999 is the greatest year for films that have ever been released. Uh, Except for bottom, this movie. Top to bottom, 1999 is pretty much perfect. Except for the Bond movie they gave us this year, which had Dr. Christmas Jones coming a, twice, a nuclear scientist played by right after Wild Things is Denise Richards. <laughs> did, did you see her on uh, on 30 Rock? No, no. She OK, so she's on 30 Rock playing herself. Okay. And okay. she has a line where she's trying to defend herself as a smart person. By saying, uh, God, what's the line? I was in a James Bong movie playing a nuclear psychiatrist. Oh. <laughs> At least she's making fun of herself. Oh, yeah. No. Wow. Honestly, though, outside of Christmas Jones, I kind of like this movie. Oh. Hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's my, it's my second favorite Pierce Brosnan movie for this, sure. The, well, okay, I'll give you that. It's my second favorite also because the other two are garbage. <laughs> but you, the, the Stockholm Syndrome movie is your is your second favorite James Bond by him. Like, she, she, like, don't get me wrong. I love Robert Carlyle. Robert Carlyle plays amazing villains, but he's terrible in this movie. As They're, is Alexa, uh, Sophia Marceau. Like, there, there are three reasons I like this movie: the stupid. cinematography, Sophie Marceau, and Robert Carlyle. Um, oh. I think they kind of saved the movie. Um, but she works with the bad great. guys to cause a nuclear explosion because they want to raise gas prices. Yeah, they had a real <laughs> hard time after the uh, after the Cold War ended. They had a real hard time coming up with plots, guys. Yeah. Yeah, I love but, that Brandon but, took that pause and he was like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll admit to but that. The, the subplot where Sophie Marceau kidnaps M is interesting. Okay, I did forget about that. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the, uh, it's it's the bond of the 90s where M is a woman. Sure. And, um, you know, she's, she's strong even though she's kidnapped. She's smart enough to be able to signal bond. It's and, Dame Judi Dench. She needs more screen time. We need to yep. give her a reason to and, be in the movie. And Robbie Coltrane gets more screen time. Yep. I really like him in this one with the, the caviar and he's tried to go straight. And... Yeah. If they yeah. had just... I don't know about those helicopters with the saws, but... Yeah. If they had just not had like Denise in Richards in it. Pretty... Yeah, Denise Richards kind of ruins it. Yeah. I don't well, that was, I mean, that was one of those where they hire for pretty, not for talent. That's a fact. And obviously the producers saw wild things and decided we need her. <laughs> they should they should have gone with Nev Campbell. I would have been more, I support that that make more sense. Yep. Uh, and then Pierce Brosnan ends his Bond legacy with one of the other worst Bond movies I've ever seen. Can I can I just leave during this part? This is my. We, we don't even really need to talk about this movie. It looks like a made-for-TV movie from the mid '90s. The CGI is shit. 
the story is shit. They have Madonna teaching people how to fence. Yep. Madonna Mar doesn't know how to fence. Miranda Frost is right before she was in uh, The Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah. There's like four Oscar winners in this Rick movie. Hume, and like Rick Hune and Michael Madsen are in this movie. Because and they were trying to spin off uh, Jinx. Jinx's character, yep. So oh, they, they had Michael Madsen yes. as Jinx's boss. Yep. And they were going to make like an American yep. 007. Jinx, girl. They were, were going to start doing Jinx movies as the female American James yeah. Bond. And then but this she was movie came out. In this, she was in Catwoman, and it just didn't <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, oh. she's won an Oscar. Judy Dench. And this was a year Oscar. after Swordfish came out. She had just done a really good movie. Yeah. And then this was complete and utter garbage. And so that So I will say the interesting thing about this. Yeah. Um, it had a hundred and forty two million dollar budget because they were celebrating the it was the 20th Bond movie. Okay. It was the 50th anniversary of the Casino Royale book. Okay. Yep. The makes sense. 40th anniversary of the Dr. No movie. And so they wanted to go over the top awesome, but they hired Lee Tamahori to direct it, who did like The Edge and Triple X State of yeah. the Union and like just really garbage movies. And, you know, they, it was a CGI fest. There's that scene where he's like surfing in. I, I don't even. Literally know. everything in the in the ice planet or ice dome or ice wow. stratosphere that they no, like yeah. everything from then on is just stupid. Let's, I like the car. The, the car concept was cool. It was but a BMW. I mean, like of course, it was cool. They shot. They shot a sky beam at an invisible car in Iceland. Like, come on. What no. was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, it's, so it's that good. that technically is the end of like an, an official James Bond run. Because then in 2006, what we literally get is is a complete reboot that 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 says none of that other stuff ever happened. And well, that brings and in Daniel Craig. It, it is really interesting, you know, even through um, Pierce Brosnan's movies, they're referencing, like, him being married to Teresa, even though that was in the mid-70s. And, like, you know, they they try to stick to continuity while not sticking to continuity at all. And... So let me, let, me, let me throw this out there. This is something I've talked to both of you guys about, but I'm, I'm going to throw it out there for the audience. What I have always wanted from James Bond and from 007 and what I think they could have done right here in 2006 is I want James Bond to be the equivalent of the Dread Pirate Roberts. I would have loved for them to have been Casino Royale starring Pierce Brosnan. Everybody comes to this movie and you go in there and you sit down and you start watching Casino Royale and the opening scene is Pierce Brosnan on a mission doing some stuff. All of a sudden he literally gets shot, falls down dead. Do your opening credit sequence. The entire audience is going, "What? wait, what? Like this is, this, this, this is, this is Casino Royale starring Pierce Brosnan. You show, you show 007's funeral. And then it's literally M's office, and you've got Daniel Craig at M's office, her saying, you now have no name, you are now 007, your identity is now known as James Bond. And basically play up the fact that 007 and James Bond is not an actual living human being, it is a persona that is carried through the years, because the name means something in the spy world. That would have been awesome. This would have been the perfect time for them to have done that to just it 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 it, it it's like the Doctor Who thing for the future. Whenever Daniel Craig is done doing it, they can literally pass it on to anybody they want to. Idris Elba can be James Bond and just be 007 James Bond. I that that has always been my my love of what I wish that they would have done with this franchise. But they didn't and we so, got 2006 so, Casino Royale. Two things real quick to that point. Uh, 
Um, mm -hmm. I'd love to see Idris Elba as Bond. I think he would have been great. But age-wise, I think he's a little too old at this point. Sean Connery uh, was 50. Yeah, but I he's not that much younger than Daniel Craig. So True. In, in, a, in a world where we're signing people to multi-picture deals and trying to make big universes, um, I don't think he works. Um, second point, it has been a big fan thing for decades that um, 007 and James Bond are a moniker. Um, wait, wait, wait. Are you telling me that I didn't come up with this? You, you did not. I'm sorry. What? I'm sorry. Um, but that's why they can always podcast kinda... over. Podcast over. Like I can't do this. <laughs> wait a minute. Like, that, wait. So my idea that I've had my entire life that I thought was my idea. You're telling me that some other fanboys came up with this? Yes. Oh yeah. man. But I don't even want that anymore. I don't even want it. I'm gonna cut it out. But it's problematic in that Roger Moore is standing at Tracy's grave. Um they reference Pierce Brosnan. Like I said, they reference Pierce Brosnan as he had been married before, and it's a it's a sore subject for okay, him. Okay, 007 so, into the multiverse. You just bring them all back. You get Sean Connery out of retirement, and you just explain that they were all Bond at the same time. Can I skip ahead? Yeah. That was one of the drafts for Skyfall. <laughs> Wait, what? So in the movie Skyfall, um, Skyfall is his childhood home where he grew up or whatever. Uh -huh. It's the training grounds, kind of like a uh, Black Widow, right? Yeah, it was like yeah. the thing. Um, and uh, Albert Finney's character is like the groundskeeper of that of now, but it was property that his parents had owned. Um, but in one of the earlier drafts, it was basically a retirement home for former Bonds, and they oh. had um, at least George Lazenby and Sean Connery signed on to reappear as retired bonds that are now living at this house. And so when he's in the um, like psych evaluation and they say Skyfall, that mean like that's referencing him being too old to be an agent. Oh. And that's why he's all upset and he leaves the room. It's because they're saying he's too old to be an agent and he needs to retire and go live in this retirement home. Um, they got as far as Sean Connery agreeing to be in it and then kind of backing out at the last minute because he thought he was physically unable to do some of the stuff. And they kind of recast him as Albert Finney and changed the role to him being a caretaker instead of a former Bond. Oh, man. But it, yeah, it was something that they kind of explored and thought about doing. I would have loved to have seen an Into the Bond verse, but... Now, now, correct me if I'm wrong, we'll get to this, but Skyfall is also the one that's Home Alone in Act 3, right? Absolutely. 100%. So I could have gotten Sean Connery in Home Alone. That would have been amazing. Yep. That's, uh, I mean, that's everybody's dream. Everybody wanted to see Sean Connery as the dad. Yeah. Uh, instead, they got that guy from Sharknado. I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I will say this. Uh, with, with Pierce Brosnan, uh, GoldenEye is amazing. I don't care about the rest of his Bond movies. That's how I feel about Daniel Craig. When I watched Casino Royale, I was very surprised at how much I really loved it and, and really enjoyed everything except the car flipping scene. Um, that was real. I'm sure it was. It still looked stupid. It, it holds the record for the most uh, roles in a uh, action yep. movie. Interesting. Yeah. Um, but but as far as Daniel Craig goes, Casino Royale is the only one of his movies I like. Um, the other thing I'll say about uh, Casino Royale was what was really big right before that movie came out uh, and probably heavily, heavily influenced it, uh, I would imagine, is the Bourne movies with Matt oh, Damon. Sure. Yep. So they went real gritty and they went real, um, tried to steal, stay like realistic as far as I remember. Um, and the only real contraption I can remember him even using is the, um, is the heart uh, charger pads yeah. or, that were in his uh, glove compartment. Like that's yeah. the only thing I can remember him using as a gadget. Everything well, else Q, is him just Q being wasn't a, even in this movie. 
no Q in this one um it was only the third movie that q hasn't shown up in to this point um he wasn't in dr no and he wasn't in the living or um uh live and let die well, uh, so, so you mean that because uh so desmond llewellyn the actual yeah. guy who played q uh was q for 36 years yeah. missed the first movie apparently missed one in the middle but then also went all the way until 1999 when he died like literally was like 90 something years old in 1999 played q and then they replaced him with john cleese was john cleese q also or did he have a different letter so um, he wasn't in Dr. No because they didn't give him a gadget. He got a new gun, but it was just kind of given to him by N. He wasn't in Live and Let Die because at the time he had a BBC series oh. that he was on. Um, and he couldn't get free for that period. And instead of recasting the role, they were just kind of like, well, we can roll without Q for this one. Um, and then they brought him back in subsequent movies. Um, with The World Is Not Enough, they recognized that he was getting old. Yep. So they cast John Cleese as his assistant that they called R. Okay. Um, and then he died before Die Another Day was filmed. Um, he did not die of old age. He died in a car accident. Oh, wow. Um, he was driving home from like a, a celebrity appearance, actually. Um, so he was still pretty active. He That's probably amazing. would have been able to be in Die Another Day. But um, yeah, just because of this accident, he didn't make it. It's hilarious when people die in car accidents, Jason. I agree. <laughs> so funny, I'm sorry, bro. sorry, you're talking about him dying and you're like, die another day. And I'm just like, so <laughs> he didn't get to do that, did he? <laughs> like, what were you shaking your head about a minute ago, Jason? I, I do, uh, I, uh, I don't remember. Uh, oh, okay. uh, if you were if we were on Pierce Bronson, uh, Bron uh, Pierce Bronson, uh, it definitely could have been just because of like that last movie. Got it. Like was so so bad. Yeah. Like, okay. like yeah. Well, we already talked about yeah. that, so let's yeah. get back to but, where uh, we are. But yeah. Anyway, so uh, I think he was promoted to Q after. Oh, okay. Um, after Desmond Llewellyn died. And then with Casino Royale, they wanted to base it in reality again, like Jason was saying. Sure. Um, kind of going back to them pulling from what's popular, like with the black exploitation, with Live and Let Die and the Moonraker and all that stuff. They did the same thing here. Porn was super popular, so oh, they yeah. kind of more grounded in reality. And all those black and white flashbacks yeah. definitely feel very boardish, like all of the hand-to-hand -hand -hand combat. Absolutely. I can definitely see well, that. They kind of got rid of Q and even through Spectre, like Q, they reinvented. He's ben, not making ben ridiculous. Ben Whipshaw or whatever. Yeah, which I actually really like Ben Whipshaw. I think he does yeah, the character cool. well. But, uh, you know, I mean, he's he's more of an IT guy. Yeah. Um, he gives Bond like a tracking device and super basic stuff like that to not invisible cars or lasers. You know. I uh, I will agree with Shane that um, for me, um, I've watched most of the Bond movies. Um, uh, I I've got no problem leaving them on, even the really like, uh, even the Pierce Bronson ones. If they're on, I might turn them on the TV and just let them play in the background. Yeah, I have no interest, no fun whatsoever in the last what two or three bond movies and I, I don't mind watching them and enjoy like watching it so that i'm uh aware of what's happened um but like it all kind of bleeds together now for uh, it's kind of reminds me of mission impossible that way where it's like this whole big arc with uh, this big specter entity going on in the background and it's like I, I remember at one point in time he said something while everybody was in an opera house and people got up and left but then I go, wait a minute, was that Mission Impossible or was that James <laughs> Bond? It's all kind of just going together in my brain now. Um, I, I, I will say two things. I think I'm going to be defending Daniel Craig a lot here probably. as we go forward. And despite that, Mission Impossible is doing the Spectre organization better than James Bond is right now. The whole idea of this underground villainous group that is running the world 
So real uh, quick, while we're addressing that, let's talk about how the Fast and the Furious franchise has stolen this concept, where you have three movies in a row with bad guys, and then the fourth movie you explain that there was one person above all three of those bad guys, which is literally what they did with Spectre when they explained to you that all three of the villains in Casino Royale, Quantum of Solace, and Skyfall all were working for Blowfield in the in the exact same way that the Fast and the Furious franchise did it. So I will say that I gave up on Fast and the Furious after the second one. I hear they get better. (laughs) But I did not like one or two. So uh I love Mission Impossible though. Sure. Um and like I said, I think they're doing way better than than James Bond is right now. Um I, I I I don't want to say James Bond has lost its way, but I think they were super excited to get the rights to Spectre back, which we can talk about when we get to Spectre. But sure. um, I mean, going back to those lawsuits with Thunderball, you know, they lost the rights to Spectre. They couldn't have Blofeld or anything for 30 years. And yep. um, I, I, I think they made some poor choices in trying to reintegrate them and make Blofeld the overarching villain. Um, I think they did things that they didn't earn. But going back to Casino Royale and starting at the beginning of Daniel Craig, um, I I love Casino Royale. It's my favorite Bond movie. It's so well shot. Um, It adapts a book that's 60 years old and modernizes it in a way that's Um, mind-blowing. I did read that it is a pretty good translation of the book. It is. Bond Even going to gamble against things, somebody, like, uh, falling for the woman that's giving him the money, her mm-hmm. death. Like, I hear it's pretty solid to the book. Um, even to the point of when they're at the airport in Miami and yep. the guy blows himself up, that it kind of adapts a part of the book where um, the main villain has these two henchmen try to blow up Bond. Oh. Um, he gives he gives them two suitcases. One's red and one's I think blue, um, and one supposedly has the bomb and one has their money. Uh, but in real life, I think they both have the bomb, and so they open one early and they end up blowing themselves up. And like, it's it's a little moment of the book, but the way it's adapted to again sixty years later and fitting within the movie, it they they make it work really well. Um, I love the book, and the movie is a really good ad- adaptation of it. Uh, so for Quantum of Solace, I cannot remember. Is this another one where uh, double, he's not 007 for the movie? Because he's on, he's on, he's on a, a revenge mission because of Vesper's murder. So um, Quantum of Solace is one that a lot of people hate. Um, yeah. I, give it, I give it a pass because it was during the writer's strike. Okay. Um, Literally, Daniel Craig is making his own lines on set because they don't have a completed script that they're working from. Interesting. I didn't know that. GM is not budging on their release date. Um, So I give it a pass as far as that goes. And the director um, was super artistic. It might be the most artistic Bond movie. Um, There are four fight scenes. And he... um, equated each of them to a different element so the first one they're driving through a quarry and it's earth there's one where they're um they're in airplanes and it's like air um the the last one the hotel that they're fighting in is a a fire because it can fire it's exploding everywhere um i thought thought that's the one the the finale is like the the water rising in the hotel and like like the building sinking or something. No, the building's on fire. Okay. They, yeah. They have these. It's in, a, uh, it's in like an oil field. Yeah, they have these units that are exploding. Huh. The whole the plot of the movie is the bad guy has um, control of these water reserves, and he's basically holding the country ransom because he has all the water, and if the citizens want any water, they have to pay him for it. Um, so isn't man and again like i'm not i might not be remembering right 
there's a guy that they're interrogating near the end of that movie that's like tied to a chair that's at the beginning uh, uh, okay so it's it's the only bond movie that's a direct sequel okay. so the end of casino royale um he finds mr white who is yes, the guy mr. that white. Yes. That like uh, killed Le Chief at the end of Casino Royale. Yep. Okay. And he finds Mr. White because Vesper leaves a message for him. Um, so he finds Mr. White, and then the opening scene of Quantum of Solace is this uh, car chase. Uh huh. And then when he gets to the end, you find out that Mr. White has been in the trunk the whole time. They take him out, and then M is interrogating him. Okay. He says, the thing you need to know about my um, organization is that we have people everywhere. And then you find out that M's assistant is working for Mr. White and shoots a bunch of people. And That's Mr. right. Okay. Um, and so this movie introduced the Quantum Group, which was because they didn't have the rights to Spectre. Spectre, okay. Um, and this is the movie, Jason, that you were talking about where they're at the opera. Um, and Bond has, he's able to get a quantum earpiece. They basically hold their meetings in public spaces and talk to each other through earpieces. Um, so he's able to get one and basically lets them all know that he's there listening. And then everybody, except for Mr. White, is stupid and gets up to leave and he takes their picture. And then M is able to figure out who all these people are there in the quantum group. And she basically dismantles the quantum group by sending a bunch of agents after them. Yeah. Which I thought was the that was actually my favorite part of that movie was the that part in the opera house. It was super cool. It was it like I said, the movie is shot really well. It's very artistically done. There's a scene in the opera house um, where there's no audio. There's like a gunfight, but there you don't hear the shots from the guns. You just hear the opera playing. Um, it's I don't. It's it's really well done. It's just that the script is bad because it wasn't completed. The writer literally up until 11.59 before the writer's strike was working on it. He emailed it off and it's like, this is all I can do. I'm sorry. Wow. So I kind of give that movie a pass. It's worth watching as the fourth act of Casino Royale. Uh, so who played Dominic Green? Was the villain um, somebody big? Um, he's recognizable, but I don't know okay, the. Actor. I I don't have his name written down. All right, Stronger so tr- has appeared in other things. Okay. One of the Bond girls. Um, she was in. Oh God, maybe Prince of Persia. Okay. Uh, uh, Gemma Arterton. Arterton. Oh, I forgot she was in that one. That's right. Yeah. yeah. She's uh she's pretty good in it as this like kind of doe-eyed, not even an agent, but somebody that M sends to keep Bond in his place and is in over her head and ends up falling for Bond. So uh, I I now look forward to you defending Home Alone to me. Uh, Skyfall. Yeah. Uh, I will admit the first... Are you time... damn is horrible. He's terrible. He's, um... he's a... He's a terrible villain. His henchmen are better than him in this movie. The scene where they take over MI6 or whatever, like that's a that's a that's that's better than anything Javier Bardem does in the movie. I don't remember that. I don't remember his henchmen. Well, um, like it's uh, <laughs> it like two thirds of the way through the movie. Isn't this the one where uh, like they're like M is in the room and and Ray Fiennes is in the room and Daniel Craig is in there and then like uh, Javier Bardem's guys storm in the room and basically like take over MI6 and there's like a huge like shootout in that in that okay like... so there's a scene where he does the Dark Knight thing where he gets caught on purpose yes 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 and yes. then he escapes his cell and he That's goes um. M is trying to answer for why the double O's should stay active. Yes. So she's at the Houses of Parliament and he bursts in and starts shooting up the place and Bond has to come in and save him. But doesn't he have henchmen that help him in that scene? It's not him by himself. I Yeah, I mean, there are other people, I think. 
I don't know. I can't picture any of his henchmen, though. I got you. That, that, that was the only thing that I remember being good in that movie was that sequence. Yeah. Uh, because after that, they go to Home Alone, and I just, I can't, I can't get over yeah. James Bond booby trapping a house. Like, so, so like I said, the first couple times I watched it, I really didn't like it because I thought it was too jokey. It was very Roger Moore. Um, and then, like you said, they get to the end and it's all Home Alone. Yeah. Um, but I do appreciate Sam Mendes, Sam Mendes's direction. Um, I he think there's an amazing um, film in 1999 called American Beauty. Yeah, uh, he yeah. Is, he is a fantastic director. Yeah, chooses really good works apparently. He he has he, there were some beautiful shots in that movie though where he's where he's underwater when he breaks through the ice and you see this shot from below him he's swimming up back up towards the ice and you see like everything's illuminated from the fire of the house. Um, there are just like three or four like gorgeous shots in that movie that I wouldn't have been able to come up with. Um, There's probably a plastic bag floating around in one of the scenes somewhere. Maybe. Dude, 1917 is the only good movie he's directed. <laughs> the only good one. Like, yeah. Oh, I just looked at his list because I was like, there's got to be something else that I enjoyed. I feel like you would have loved Jarhead. I don't know why, but I feel like you would have really liked Jarhead. Jarhead's, I, a good movie. I, Jarhead's fine. But yeah. I didn't love it. Yeah. Like and I don't attribute anything to like his directing in that movie. It's fine. And like I said, it's just fine. It's yeah. a it's a PTSD movie. Like what yeah. I mean, I get it, but like, yeah, 1917 was hands down like the most beautiful thing to watch last year. I agree. Very easily. Um, but like that's the only movie where I looked at his list and I was like, I like I don't even like Road to Perdition. And so many people love that movie. Um, That's a movie but yeah, the the interesting thing with uh, with him, Sam Mendes, and Daniel Craig is uh, uh, Rachel Weiss. Oh yeah, yep. They've both been married to her. Yep. And yep. Uh, is one of them married to her? To Daniel, Daniel, Daniel Craig, Craig is married, Craig to, her married, married yeah. to her but uh, <laughs> Sam Mendes was married to her during Road to Perdition. Yeah, in the early 2000s. So they have this weird Eskimo friendship. brothers. Thing <laughs> <going> <laughs> yeah, but they're like best of friends. <laughs> it's right. so. Weird. Then, um, then, but, then we. But yeah, I I don't know. There's there's something about Skyfall that has grown on me. It it looks really pretty. Um, it's a good kind of classic Bond movie in a time that they had gotten it away from Bond. Like they were doing all this, like, you know, born, born identity kind of yeah. stuff. And, you know, he. Well, and like he, even the plot to this, like, isn't the reason that Javier Bardem wants to kill M is because he was a double O agent. Yeah. And like he feels like she screwed him over or something. Like he, he went on a mission and like got abandoned or. I don't even remember. I thought like he tried to kill himself and it didn't take. Like, That's why he's was supposed to. Oh, up. He, oh, he yeah, bit yeah. down like, on the. He bit down on the cyanide pill. The cyanide pill, but it just fucked up his face. It didn't kill him. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, I forgot about that. And so, that's totally M's fault. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so he wants to obvious. kill M because of that. Yeah. Well, um, and then and then yeah. we get we get Spectre next, which my notes about Spectre are. Bond and Blowfield are stepbrothers. Ugh. Really? Yeah. Really? Somebody, somebody watch Austin Powers. Oh and yeah. Decided yeah. to adapt that. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, like, 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 literally, it happened, and that's exactly what went through my head. I it, like, like, yeah. That why, why, why? Okay. So remember what I said earlier about how they get a new actor in, they make four movies and they're over the top and ridiculous. And then they come crashing back down to earth. So we've got, you know, if you, if you kind of ignore Dr. No and consider that to be like, just kind of finding their footing. Yep. Um, so the fifth movie for Sean Connery was you only live twice, which has an over the top budget and is completely ridiculous. And then they come crashing down to Honor Majesty's Secret Service, which is a good like character piece. 
Um, the fourth Roger Moore movie is Moonraker. I mean, we don't have to talk about how that's a cartoon. Nope. And then they do For Your Eyes Only after that, which, like I said, is kind of middle of the road forgettable, but it's not, you know, it's it's kind of coming down. Um, you know, the fourth Pierce Brosnan movie was Die Another Day, where you've got, you know, sunbeams shooting at invisible cars, and then you've got Casino Royale. And then again, they've built up to Spectre where they try to do too much. It's over the so, top. He didn't, you know, uh, Blofeld didn't need to be his brother. That's just no. stupid. Yeah, um, no reason. I love Hinks, uh, Dave Batista. I thought he was really oh. good. Yeah, he, he was. Yeah. But he survives, like, being thrown off of a moving train. And, like, he's just, like, overpowered. Yeah. Uh, it's the Michael Myers of... <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. The 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 coolest scene is when James Bond is escaping Blofeld's lair and he's like shooting everybody. But it was when Daniel Craig had a broken leg. So his foot's in a cast. So he's like kind of slowly walking and like shooting from afar. So you lose a lot of the emphasis of the scene and it's just kind of okay. Like, yeah. uh, I, I agree. Spectre is not great. But it, it has good parts. Like I think Christoph Waltz is a good villain, but the part that was written for him wasn't great. His his it, plan is to launch Big Brother for criminal activities. Yeah, he's 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 trying to have a, a facial recognition software for bad guys. Yeah. So that he so they get track. Adam Adam Scott. Adam Scott. Is that his name from? Uh, from uh, Sherlock? Uh, Andrew Scott. Andrew, Andrew Scott. Scott. Yes, yeah. Andrew Scott. Got you, yep. Yeah, so they get him because nobody's going to think he's a bad guy. <laughs> and they get him to play somebody who turns out to surprisingly be a bad guy. I don't yep. know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's cool stuff. I, I really love Rafe Fiennes as M. I think he's, he's a great M. Um, and I love seeing him, Money Penny, and Q out in the field. You know, they were taking down Andrew Scott, and I think sure. that worked really well. Um, I, I don't really care for Bond falling in love again. This yeah. is three out of his four movies where he is monogamous and just kind of falls in love with the person he's with. And sure. I mean, I get it's more of a modern thing, but it's going to be weird seeing a Bond girl carry over to the next movie in No Time to Die. Yep. Now in November. Um, man, we should have seen that by now. We should have seen that two months ago. It was, it was well, it was supposed to come out uh, Valentine's Day. Well, oh, good call. Yeah, yeah. Let's cross our fingers that we get to see it in November. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, you know, I'm not to skip ahead to No Time to Die, but I'm kind of looking, looking forward, forward to it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it too. I think the good. preview looks good. Yeah. Um, it gives me hope. It'll it'll be interesting to see how they give him closure because. Um, when they delayed it to November, um, Daniel Craig went to the producers and said, I don't want you to advertise it as my last Bond movie. Oh. I think he's waiting to see if this turns out really good and has a, um, a big box office. I think he'd be willing to come back and do more. Um, he, by all accounts, he relied on his stunt double a lot more in this movie. Okay. Um, and in he got injured in every movie leading up to this one. Um, and it just delayed things and it aggravated him. And I think he was just kind of burned out, even though he's made pretty, I mean, he's made four movies in 10 years. Like it's not as prolific as, you know, Sean Connery's or anything. Sure. But he's, he was really big on doing his own stunts and everything until this movie. And so he was really putting himself on the line. And I think it was very physically taxing. Um, I, I think he's a good bond. He's very close to the bond that's, that's in the books. Um, and I would be okay with him doing another one personally. And it's, it's very uh, interesting. Uh, if he does learn to lean on his stunt guy and let him do more of the stunt stuff, it reminds me of an article I just read this week about Blade Trinity, which I know Jason hates, but apparently Wesley Snipes' stunt double has more screen time as Blade in that movie 
than Wesley Snipes does. <laughs> because Wesley Snipes only agreed to do the movie if he only had to do the close-up scenes. Yeah. So every action scene or anything that's like a wide shot isn't even Wesley Snipes in the movie. It's his stunt double. So like if Daniel Craig can learn to let his stunt double take a little more control, maybe we'll get him for some more Bond movies. Yeah. Well, and I uh, uh, kind of said that. I didn't help heard... Blade Trinity at all. Well, I no, heard uh, Ryan Reynolds uh, did in the Mandalorian. Pedro Pascal. Oh is yeah, barely, barely, barely any screen time. It's mostly any. ADR. Yep. Um, uh, I, I saw an interview with Bryce Dallas Howard where she was like, "Yeah, my entire episode that I filmed, never met Pedro Pascal once. He <laughs> he never came to set. He was never there." Uh, what a fucking gig, guys! Can we get that? <laughs> One of us get in on some uh, some voiceover work. In, in ten episodes, you show your face and have to be in the suit one time. Like, Love it. Get paid money, record some ADR lines, and you're good. Yeah. yeah. They probably save a ton of money from that, though. If you think about it, from a from a budgeting standpoint, they're like, "Hey, look, all you're doing is ADRing. We'll get some Yahoo to be in the suit." until we need you to be in the suit sure. and then you show up on the set for like four days out of the entire time we're shooting this thing so the next so, bond movie they just need to put him in a suit well dude yeah. like uh but i was just reading the He's other the day that they're using the, fighter pilot. The, the same uh virtual effects for the obi-wan series yep. as they did for with the mandalorian, the mandalorian. Yep. so because you can literally the television shows a, a whole lot easier and cheaper to make that way yep so well, uh, even you know they're they're getting so far with like the deep fake and all that stuff. Like, oh yeah, you know you've seen you've seen the set photos of uh, the new Batman movie, where it's clearly the stunt double in the Batman suit. Sure, but he's got you know the dots on his face where the suit isn't uh -huh. you know covering him, and they can just put in Robert Pattinson's jaw and yep. have you know have him deliver the lines. Like, I totally have not seen those pictures. That's oh, yeah, really they're, yeah, they're definitely out there. Yeah, if if you just look for uh, like set photos from the new Batman movie, it's it's all the stunt double at this point. It's not Robert Pattinson. Yeah. Uh, so there we Probably. go. We we covered all of the James Bond movies. The the absolute last thing that I wanted to talk about with James Bond, which we've ran way longer than any other episode, but that's fine with me. Um, we had twenty five movies to talk about. We had a lot of movies to talk about. Uh, I I came up with five. Uh, influence or pr five things that were influenced by James Bond. Uh, well, actually, the fir first thing I want to mention is the side thing to all of this is um, I feel like from what I've read, a lot of the books were very Jean Leclerc like. Um, so I always would have liked to have seen more of a of a super spy Jean Leclerc type James Bond like. Not, not uh, obviously, James Bond is an action hero to all of us, but apparently, a, a lot of the books focused more on the spy aspect of it than what he became. Absolutely, but, to that, to that point, I'm sorry, no, 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 go. Uh, to, to that point, I would say I've read uh, probably about half the Fleming books at this point, okay. Um, and they are almost completely different to the movies. Casino Royale, like I said, is a pretty close adaptation. Yeah. Uh, From Russia with Love is pretty close. But beyond that, you know, they're just using the name gotcha. and maybe some characters' names. I would love to see a, let's just say, Netflix series where they do like three to five episode seasons, mm -hmm. like a BBC show. Yep. And they get somebody like, uh, the dude that plays Loki, can't think of his name right now. Tom Hiddleston. Tom Hiddleston. Tom Hiddleston to play like just kind of that scrawny Bond. Okay. Make him period pieces and do actual adaptations of the books where he's an actual spy and not just an action hero. Yeah. Um, That'd be cool. I, I would love that. That would be really cool. I think it'd be really, really cool. All right. So the five the five properties that I have come up with that I feel were very influenced by James Bond. Obviously, we've talked about Austin Powers numerous times. We got a trilogy of those films. Johnny English. We got a trilogy of those films. Dude, okay. You laugh, but do you know who wrote the the Johnny English movies? No. Uh, so it's a writing team, uh, Purvis and Wade. 
Okay. They have also been involved in every James Bond movie since I want to say Tomorrow Never Dies. Really? Yep. Interesting. All right. They had all these ideas that were basically nixed by the the Bond production team, and so they made comedy versions. And that's and hilarious. That's Bond. really cool. Uh, yeah. On the comedy okay. on the comedy aspect, we had Spy Hard, the Leslie yeah. Nielsen film. Oh. Oh, uh, you weren't a fan of that. <laughs> no, no, okay. no, not a big fan. Uh, in the in the seventies, we got the uh, Our Man Flint and In Like Flint, mm -hmm. which I felt were yep. very much more serious yet still comedic takes on the James Bond franchise. Uh, but I, I, unlike Austin Powers, I didn't feel like they were trying to completely make fun of it, but they were just trying to be a humorous version of James Bond. They didn't take story beats like Austin Powers did, right? Uh, and then, and then the last one, which uh, I like this movie, was Triple uh, X with Vin Diesel. I feel like that was an attempt to create um, a modern African American version of James Bond. He was very womanizing. He had he they instead of giving him gadgets, they gave him a snowboard and let him do extreme sports. Um, we ended up getting three of those movies also. And Lee Tamahori, one of the directors, directed a Bond movie. <laughs> there you Make go. Yeah. Um, so that is everything that I have for my notes. I had no idea this was going to be over two hours long. <laughs> wow. Uh, but again, well, like you I said, mean, you... 25 movies to talk about. That's a lot. Yeah. You can make this episode seven and eight, man. You cut it right down the middle. 007 <laughs> and eight. Two. 007 <laughs> two. Uh, I mean. 007.5. Yeah. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how editing goes tomorrow. Uh, I still have not. Uh, I realized about an hour ago that I haven't picked what episode eight is going to be yet. So I have, I have nothing to plug for episode eight. I still haven't done my uh my five dollar apple bin yet though. So I need to make time to do that little extra episode that I want to do. Um, but uh, thank you guys so much for being on here with me. Uh, yeah. Brandon, is there any last Bond tidbits that you have that we didn't that we didn't talk about? Uh, not that I can think of. I would Jason. say revisit some of the older ones. I think you'll find them more entertaining than you think. Um, my top five would be, in no particular order, Casino Royale, um, From Russia with Love, Honor Majesty's Secret Service, Golden Eye, and maybe. The Living Daylights. Right on. Uh -huh. What were you about to say, Jason? Um, at some point, you I thought you were going to continue um, a story about... Um, oh, The Living Daylights. Before we move no, on to Brosnan. Was it Live and Let Die? Or live, one, of the, one of the Dalton ones. A View to a Kill. View to a Kill. View to a Kill. Yeah, you said you had a, you had a tidbit. Oh, me? Yeah. Oh, uh, no, I was just going to throw in um, there's this weird uh, kind of B story that is about um, when Bond is first looking into Christopher Walken's character. Um, Christopher Walken has like a bunch of horses that are roided out that he's winning a bunch of races with. And uh, he's got Patrick McNee, who was in the Avengers show. Okay. Um, He's he's like this uh, super proper like horse expert, like racehorse expert, and uh, he gets sent with Bond to investigate Christopher Walken's character, and he's posing as Bond's like driver, and so the whole time Bond's just treating him like complete shit, like, oh Tibbet, why don't you grab my bags? And this guy is like this super classy like expert in racing horses, and he's like okay and so it's like carrying bonds bags around and they just they have a really good back and forth with each other um and it's it's kind of part of the charm of the movie for me like i said it's not a great movie but it's kind of comfort food for me and just to to see them interacting with each other is a lot of fun and uh also um dolph lundgren has a cameo in the movie oh he, He's nice. one of the henchmen. He was dating um, Grace Jones at the time. So, Who wasn't? <laughs> <laughs> so he plays one of uh, 
uh, Walken's henchman. Yeah. Nice. Kind of a cool little cameo. Well, again, thank you guys very much for being on here and talking to me. We'll see if this becomes one episode or two. Uh, yeah. But thank you for your time tonight. We definitely talked a lot, and it was a lot of fun. So it's very good to see you guys. Um, quarantine is still technically going on for our for our business, so we'll see how much longer that lasts. Um, but we'll uh, we'll keep trying to do these and talking to each other. Uh, so thank you guys very much. Uh, that is it for episode seven, maybe episode seven and a half, seven point eight, point five, point eight, whatever of uh, Chain Talks. I appreciate you guys who have made it all this way listening to us talk about the James Bond franchise. Uh, it was one that I was excited to revisit. I've spent the last week uh, watching a bunch of videos and reading a bunch of articles about the entire franchise. And now, thanks to Brandon, I know the actual specific ones I need to go back and make sure that I rewatch this week. Uh, so if you made it this far, thank you for listening. And I don't know what the next episode is going to be yet. Previously, uh, I've mentioned some ideas that I've got going on, so we'll just pick one of those and uh, we'll go with it. So thanks for listening.